Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, what we're here today is to move the process along on going to conference on the budget resolutions. I just spent uh, the last week doing 25 listening sessions throughout the 1st Congressional District, which is the district I'm privileged to represent, um, talking to the people I represent about the fiscal future of America, how we just changed, uh, just went through this process of in the House passing a budget resolution, the other body passing their version of the budget resolution. There's very little distinction between the President's budget, the House passed budget resolution, and the Senate budget resolution, so therefore, this move to go to conference should not be a very lengthy conference because the differences between the two are very few and far between with the exception of the process called reconciliation. We'll talk about that a little bit more often, but I think it's important to understand what this is. And I, I spent a lot of my time talking with constituents about that because they think sort of when you pass a budget resolution, the budget is done and it's passed. That's kind of how it works in our state legislatures, which is a budget is a budget and it's passed and it's executed. This is the beginning of the process, not the ending of the process. The best way to think about the process we're doing or engaging in and what we're doing right here with the budget resolution is the budget resolution is the fiscal architecture of the federal government. It's the blueprints of what our government should look like, how big it should get, what is the fiscal policy of it. So we are here debating these blueprints of the federal government. And the blueprints were approved by the House a couple weeks ago, by the Senate, and now the idea here is to uh, smooth out any differences, which are very few and far between, and then move forward to implement the component parts of the budget. So once this process is done, then we have the architectural diagrams in place, then we go start building the government that's being proposed here. The new cap and trade legislation, new national health care legislation, all these new spending bills, the tax increases. That's where Congress goes from here, which is once the budget resolution is done, start implementing these pieces, the goal of which is by this fall, all of this is in law and is done. Let me reiterate what we're talking about here. Just the huge magnitude of what's being proposed here. Just with respect to the cost of government to the future generations, our debt. This budget proposes more debt, more borrowing under this presidency than all prior presidencies combined. This budget proposes that our publicly held debt, the amount of bonds we have to go out there and sell to the Chinese, to the Japanese, to other people to cash flow our government, our debt will double in five and a half years and triple in ten and a half years. What's more, what this budget says we ought to do is we should chase ever higher spending, an unprecedented level of new spending with ever higher taxes. It not only proposes the largest tax increase in American history, which is $1.5 trillion, taxes on energy, taxes on incomes, on small businesses, on the very investments that make up our savings portfolios, our 401ks, our pension plans, things that have probably gone down by about 40% for the average American. Not only are those tax increases huge, the spending increases are much larger. And so what these architectural de de designs do, what this blueprint for the federal government that the President has sent to Congress, that Congress is now in the midst of rubber stamping due, is it says, let's have this unprecedented gusher of new spending, let's chase it with higher taxes, those taxes never quite catch up with the spending, and the result is an unprecedented increase in our national debt. Mr. Speaker, this is how you end prosperity in America. Name me a great country that has been able to increase standards of living, increase jobs, increase prosperity, where they increase the size of government, the taxes of government, the borrowing of government like this. This is an unprecedented spending, taxing, and borrowing spree, which we simply do not stand for, which we simply can't go along with. And I want to draw your attention to one other point. This unprecedented borrowing spree is done in the face of an already bleak fiscal future for this country. This is a, a, an ad that's been taken out in many newspapers across America by the Peter G. Peterson Foundation, a nonpartisan advocacy group that says America should get its fiscal house in order. It just shows this tip of the iceberg. Today's economic crisis is the tip of the iceberg. What this says is, right now, to pay the bills for the federal government, right now, to make sure 
that the government programs that everybody have come to know, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, right now, those three programs alone show us a $56 trillion unfunded liability. What that means is, for everybody in America today, my mother's generation, my generation, my children's generation, my children are four, five, and seven years old, for us to pay the bills of all the government promises that are being made to these three generations, today we would have to set aside $56 trillion invested at treasury rates in order to just make sure that these programs are solvent. It's an enormous fiscal liability. Rather than tackling this problem, rather than confronting America's fiscal wreck that's coming, rather than getting us under control, what does this budget resolution do? It makes it worse. It adds more debt on top of this debt. It is saying, never mind the fact that all these programs are going insolvent, never mind the fact that we're not even prepared for the baby boomers, never mind the fact that today the per household debt is $483,000 per household. For every household in America, right now today, they owe $483,000 just to pay the bills we've already racked up that are unpaid for the federal government. The majority wants to what? Not fix it, but make it worse. And rather than getting spending under, the, under control, it goes out of control. I mean, the Environmental Protection Agency this year alone gets a 124% increase in their budget. On and on and on the spending goes. Rather than getting taxes under control, so entrepreneurs can keep more of what they earn, so small businesses, the economic engine of America, have an incentive to go back to work to hire people, not to lay people off, Taxes go out of control. And rather than tackling this challenge of debt, what are they doing? They're accelerating our increase of debt. Accelerating this pro the fact that $483,000 per family are owed today and makes it much, much worse. And at the end of the day, what it's really all about is freedom. The question really before the American people today is, with the government taking more and more money out of your pocket, with the government growing and making more and more decisions here in Washington, with the government making the decisions on how your health care is to be delivered, rather than you and your, your doctor making the decision, with the government taking over the energy sector, the health care sector, 25% of our economy, with the government saying to future generations, we're going to have to take more money out of your pocket in order to pay the bills, in order to borrow the money, you have less freedom. This just shows you how the president and the majority here in Congress are proposing a dramatic and radical new increase in the size of government way beyond where we have historically been. I asked the Congressional Budget Office before this budget came due, what will the tax rates on my three children have to be if we're going to have to finance all this growth of government through taxes, which ultimately must happen? If the government's to spend beyond its means by borrowing, somebody's going to have to pay that back through higher taxes. And that's the next generation. And the answers I got from the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office keep me awake at night. As I mentioned, I'm in my late 30s. My kids are four, five, and seven years old. And what they said was really scary. They said that by the time my three kids are my age, in order to pay these bills that they're racking up for them, the lowest tax bracket in America today, the 10% bracket, would have to go up to 25%. The middle income tax bracket, for middle-income taxpayers, would have to go to 66% income tax rate. In the top tax bracket, the one that the small businesses pay, would go to 88%. That's the ending of America. That's the end of prosperity. That is severing the, the legacy of this country. And the legacy of this country is that each generation takes its challenges seriously, fixes those problems, so that they can bequeath onto the next generation a more prosperous, a more secure America. We are at risk for severing that legacy for the first time in the history of this country. If we consign to the next generation that burden of debt, that increase in tax rates, there is no way we will be able to provide a higher standard of living to the next generation of Americans. But the matter is even more urgent than that. The matter is urgent to the fact that we are in the worst recession we've seen since the 1940s. It's a global recession. And the question we ought to be asking ourselves, should we be raising all these taxes in the middle of a recession? Should we be raising the energy fees 
on consumers by anywhere from $1,600 to $3,500 a year in a recession? Should we be raising taxes on small businesses which create most of our jobs in a recession? Should we be raising taxes on the assets that make up our pension plans, our children's 401k plans, their college education plans, our IRAs, in a recession? Of course not. Unfortunately, that's precisely what the president and this budget does. This is a huge moment for America. It's a moment where America, and Americans may not know this because they're greasing this thing through so fast. It's a moment where America may, may abandon its tireless principles, its timeless ideas that built this country. The idea that the goal of government is to protect our rights and to equalize opportunity for all so people can stake their claim and make the most of their lives and replace that with more of a Europeanized notion where we try to micromanage the results of people's lives, where people are less concerned about their liberty and more concerned about con security. We believe in having a safety net to help people who cannot help themselves. We believe in having a safety net to help people when they're down on their luck. But we reject the philosophy and the approach of this budget, which says we need to have more than that. We need to have a society where more and more Americans become dependent on the government itself for their own well-being. We want people to maximize their potential. We want people to make the most of their lives. We don't want to lull people in lives of complacency where they're becoming more and more dependent upon the federal government. We have seen what those ideas do. We see them on display in foreign capitals all around the world. Higher unemployment, lower standard of living, stagnant wages, decaying societies. That's not America. That is not what this country is. It's not the idea of America. We want the idea of America that we've known for the 21st, 20th century to be the idea of America in the 21st century. That's what this budget is about. That's what this blueprint or this architecture we're debating here today is really all about. With that, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to reserve the balance of my time.